All right, welcome back to <clears throat> our comments. I'm going to be reviewing the comments that I got this period of time between my previous comment video. This period of time is primarily centered around Strange New Worlds. There may be comments in here that are not about Strange New Worlds. That's fine. They're going to be included. Just know that our comment review videos are going to coincide with the finale of a season. The way I see it, that's an easier way to keep this straight in my head, and it's an easier way to keep these videos from getting overly long. So, let's take a look at what's going on with these comments. Okay. Uh, Michael Papp, first up, commenting on Strange New World Season 1, Episode 1, Review, Big Stick Diplomacy. I'm pretty sure they mentioned Spock and T'Pring being matched as kids in the episode. Yeah, they did mention Spock and T'Pring being uh, matched together in the episode uh, one of Strange New Worlds. Uh, I, I don't know if... Maybe I didn't make that clear in that review, but I knew that it, they, they allude to the fact that they have these arranged marriages in Strange New Worlds, and that's fine. But the issue with Strange New Worlds was that uh, previous to this point... My takeaway from the first episode of Season 2 of TOS was that Spock had to look at that picture of T'Pring, and then he, he said, surely she'll be, like, beautiful when she's fully grown. And, like, the, the implication is that they did not see each other since they were children, but in this timeline, they see each other often. So that was the issue at hand, but... Um, if in that review, I, I happen to neglect saying that they were already, um, uh, married together, you know, as children, uh, in that review. And I, I happen to neglect saying that they were mentioned it in that episode. Then I, I apologize, but yeah, thank you, Michael Papp. Uh, Kenny Fordham on Strange New Worlds. Season 1, Episode 10, uh, Imposter Maroon. That's that's the finale for Season 1. In TOS, there was an episode where Sulu say that at least uh, a shuttle can do Warp 1. Or at best, I should say. Uh, yeah, um, there was a, I did mention in that review, there was a few instances where they could do Warp 1. Or they, they could warp. But my, my thinking on that was that it was another one of those situations where they can't warp unless they say they can. Like, there was some confusion. There's confusion around warp in shuttles until around TNG, actually. Like, you could clearly tell what ones could and couldn't. And then in DS9, they blew the doors off it and, and had, like, you know, a runabout, right? And I always took it that something was classed differently if it was a warp-capable shuttle. But then when you retroactively put that into a previous era, it seems strange. It's one of those things where it's like a soft engineering where it works for that plot unless it doesn't, right? Like, And by the way, just seeing a warp nacelle does not mean warp. Like some of the old shuttles... They would, they would have, it looked like they had warp nacelles, right? On the bottom that they would land on. Okay, a warp nacelle, in my view, in my headcanon, doesn't necessarily mean it can do warp one, because there is such a thing as going between zero and one, remember. You can use a nacelle to go warp 0.5, right? So there is, you know, there is a gradation of warp between zero and one that people aren't factoring in sometimes when they see in a cell same idea as a warp nacelle but it's only giving you less than one if you can call that warp like is that warp i don't know but what we're doing is we're affecting gravity we're affecting space we're using a gravimetric induction manifold to induce uh, tension on the fabric of space around us so maybe maybe warp 0.5 is warp you know I don't know, you're not going faster than light, but there's warp involved. So anyway, thank you, Kenny Fordham, uh, for bringing that up. Uh, 
I am not a an I am not a nugget blackheart f- uh, for Strange New World season one. I seen episode season one episode ten uh, Imposter Maroon. Um. Okay. Yeah, the Starbase Eleven shuttlecraft had war capability, but they couldn't catch up to the Enterprise. Yeah, that makes sense. Was that was that in the Menagerie? Maybe I'm wrong on that, but yeah, there was um, shuttles based out of star bases that could warp confirmed, and they could catch up to uh, not catch up to the Enterprise. Sorry. Um, so indeed, if you can't catch the Enterprise, but you were trailing it, you must have been warping, right? Uh, because there's a huge difference between impulse and warp. If that's not clear, uh, again. I am not a, a nugget blackheart uh, for the same episode. Paul Wesley's version of Kirk reminds me of James Cowley's version of Kirk on the fan series Star Trek New Voyages. I haven't seen that, but you've piqued my interest, and I may check it out. Um, I have seen Star Trek Continues. Uh, I thought Kirk and that was pretty good, but maybe I'll look at James Cowley's. I mean, as someone who express some dissatisfaction with Paul Wesley's Kirk. Maybe I'll have the same feeling towards this Kirk in Star Trek New Voyages, but that's not all bad. Like, I may check it out. So thanks for pointing that out. I am not a nugget, Blackheart. (laughs) This is interesting. Power Cage is showing up to comment on the previous comment video. Power Cage. I like black licorice too, but it may be an Italian thing for me. Well, um, I have no, <laughs> I have no idea what the history is behind black licorice. I don't know. I just eat it. I don't know where it comes from or, or why or how. <laughs> what would make somebody like it more than another? Um, but uh, I, I, I like it too, and I'm glad you like it. But they do dunk on it more than once in Star Trek. What is going on with with new Star Trek and black licorice? I don't know. But glad I'm glad you like it, and uh, it let you'll have to elaborate on why that's an Italian thing. I don't, I don't know. Pa- power cage again. How dare you ignore me? You're not being ignored now. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, power cage. Again, you've been here for a while. Uh, Star Trek: Strange New World season one episode nine. Uh, eggs erroneous. This is a uh, this is from all those who wander uh, the the horror episode of Strange New Worlds. Uh, Bioshock sixty nine says this episode could have been very good could could have been very good. In, it's just dumb and a rip off from Aliens. I expected better going by the trailer for this episode, but all they have done is made this a, a nonsense and nothing. And nothing makes sense to the Gorn's biology and how they evolved. Even I could do a better story from this. I don't even understand why we have Sam Kirk in the show. He is hardly in it. Just another waste of a character. Just like Hammer was love him or hate him. They never made use of him. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. It's... This, uh... I think this episode... I don't think it's going to age well. Um, I didn't like it. I thought it was the worst of this season. Of course, you watching may think different, but Bioshock 69 seems to not like it. Seems to be in agreement with me. Um, doesn't make sense to the Gorn's biology. Yeah, it. I pointed out from what we knew about seeing the Gorn, just from what we knew on screen, from what was canon, it suggested to me that what was portrayed in this episode was not congruent with what we could have um, put together in our own mind. Maybe we were extrapolating based on incomplete information, but it didn't feel like it matched up. It felt like there was a disconnect here. It felt like we were seeing like <sighs> some bizarre Delta Quadrant animal. It did not feel like a Gorn. Um, 
I mean, I know maybe we're not exactly in the same timeline, but it just it felt like they were sleazily using something we knew to do something they wanted to do, you know? They wanted to have an episode that was a ripoff of Aliens. They didn't want to create their own alien, so they just took the Gorn, right? See, it's this classic idea of taking what people know and changing it into something you already wanted to make, you know? It's like I have a story here where there's these uh, aliens, and they're in this big ship, and it's called a sarcophagus ship, and they're worshipping their dead, and uh, they, they have weird single ridge on their head and they got no hair and they're kind of they're kind of menacing looking and um one of them's an albino and uh basically there's this ship using a thing called a spore drive that's trying to destroy them oh what's that uh you guys need a new script for a new star trek show well i happen to have this script right here for this weird show I just invented. Hey, yeah. We can rewrite this so it's Star Trek. Sound familiar? Sound like season one of Discovery? All these weird things that don't feel like they belong? It's probably just other ideas for other shows that they couldn't get forward. Similarly, this episode of Strange New Worlds. It's probably just some other script. You know? And they said, well, we can make it the Gorn. We got all these cool ideas for an alien, but... We're not brave enough to try to put forward a new alien because people might not like it. So we'll steal the Gorn, just like we stole the Klingons and made them totally different. Again. So thank you, Bioshock69. Power Cage for Strange New Worlds Season 1, Episode 9. Digging the new outfit, buddy. It wasn't a new outfit. It was just a haircut. Just joking. Um... It, it, all it was was a different badge. Um, I just decided to check out the um, uh, Strange New World style badge. It wasn't a new outfit. It was just a badge. So uh, thanks for noticing something. You're the only person to have mentioned it. Um, thank you, Power Cage. Uh, Dennis Jordan. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Look, I love Kirk, William Shatner, but if these goddamn Gorns are so badass, how in the hell will Shatner fight and defeat one of these reptilian demons? I know. What? The Gorn captain was in a state of hibernation when he fought Kirk, or was T.O.S. Kirk versus Gorn just basically a comedy? At least we can bring the Metrons into 2022 fairly easily. Look how that effer was dressed. You're a non-binary, aren't you, A? I don't... Wait a minute, look. How that MF stress. Oh, you're... Okay, he's, he's talking about uh, the old Metrons. Yeah, okay. How they're... Yeah. So this is like... This turns into like... um Commentary on TOS at the end. Because I don't think there was a Metron in... Uh, <laughs> Strange New Worlds... Yeah, so, okay, yeah, what he's saying basically is that William Shatner, William Shatner's Kirk in TOS, there's no way he could have fought this, a grown-up version of this Gorn. Presumably, the Gorn in Strange New Worlds, when they grow up, they're going to be more ferocious, right? Like, three babies threaten, like, a a team of Starfleet officers on their home turf, on on a Federation ship that they know the ins and outs of. So, it's, you know, it's just, it makes one wonder how Kirk could fight one alone in an alien environment, certainly. And I don't, I don't think this Kirk, Paul Wesley's Kirk, could even, I don't think he could fight uh, one Romulan. <laughs> I don't let alone a Gorn. I'm just saying, I just get that perception. Sorry. And he's trying to, and Dennis Jordan is trying to come up with, any kind of reason he can for why he might not... (laughs) This makes sense. Was the Gorn Captain in a state of hibernation? Yeah. Or was it basically a comedy? Yeah, they're going to reveal that the entire thing was staged and it was a theatrical production that the crew was watching. And really, they were just buds the whole time. We were just making a movie for the people on the Enterprise to watch. That's what happened in that episode, yeah. (laughs) No. 
at least we can bring the Metrons into 2022. So if this is a speculation that they can bring that back for the next season. Uh, look how they're dressed. You're a nine non-binary, aren't you, eh? I guess this is um, speculation based on the uh, dress style of Metrons that we've seen in TOS, where it just looks like some kind of androgynous, uh, shiny dress thing, if I'm just remembering off the top of my head correctly. And now it would be reclassified as non-binary, which means like agender or something, or like not confined to um, a gender that is um, A or B, basically. Um, that's, I mean, maybe they would do that if we've seen that in season two. So thank you, um, Dennis Jordan, uh, for that comment on Star Trek Strange New World Season 1, Episode 9. Dennis Jordan, uh, again, the same episode. Uh, Hudson, sir, he's Hicks. Or uh, Sam Kirk, sir, he's Hicks. Geez. <laughs> This is what you get when you throw the thing with Alien and Aliens and Predator movies into a blender. Sounds about right. Uh, if you were at all genre savvy of what was going on in Strange New Worlds um, Season 1, Episode 9, you would have just been able to play the whole episode back in your head before you even seen it, because it's so derivative and so boring. And Guys, it's just... It's just not... It was just wasn't an episode of Star Trek. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but thanks. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Um, Kevin Acklin for... Oh, we got someone coming back to try to torture themselves with Picard Season 2. Uh, this is from Picard Season 2, Episode 8. Kevin Acklin says, I feel we all needed to know about the... All we needed to know about the Gorn was addressed in the arena. What the... Um, this feels like it's posted to the wrong video. I haven't seen this before. Okay, well, Kevin Acklin says, uh, I feel all we need to know about the Gorn was addressed in the Arena episode with Kirk. The Gorn were a one-off antagonist creation for that specific episode. I really don't think it's got legs to be a big bad villain. Yeah. I didn't like this Strange New Worlds episode either. I'm, in, I'm pretty much in agreement with Kevin Acklin here. Um, and about uh, saying they don't have legs to be a big bad villain. People probably thought that about the Ferengi, too. And what we didn't get with the Ferengi was a villain. What we got was an interesting race, right? So it, say that the Gorn don't make a particularly threatening villain. Fine. Make them interesting. That's what that's a direction I would have gone in. Like, I would have had Gorn crew members by the time we got to, say, Voyager, say, post-Voyager, say, Nemesis, something like that, you know? That would have been cool. But uh, for all I know, there were Gorn crew members. I just, maybe in the background somewhere, I don't know. There were Saurians, I think. Not that they're the same. But uh, you get the picture. Yeah, so this, this comment was put on Picard Season 2. I feel like that's a mistake, but Kevin Acklin, thanks for the comment. Uh, here comes Undertaker, 45. Strange New World, Season 1, Episode 9. The night before the writer saw Alien vs. Predator and said, That's our Gorn! <laughs> That's our Gorn! <laughs> That's what they did, too. Oh my god, they said Alien vs. Predator, and it's like, Guys, we got it. We got this. Dude, we need to get to ten episodes for this season. We need one more. Uh, We just watched Alien vs. Predator. Thanks, Undertaker45. Oh, here comes you-know-who. Here's Michael Strathmore uh, giving us another novel. Uh, Star Trek Strange New World, Season 1, Episode 9, review. Greetings and salutations. The following are my real-time reactions as I watch Star Trek Strange New World, Season 1, Episode 9. All those who wonder. As always, these novel-length rants of mine aren't meant to be tongue-in-cheek. Are meant to be tongue-in-cheek, sorry. So for heaven's sake, don't take it too seriously. Don't worry, I don't take anything seriously. I may like something you don't and vice versa. Read if you like, don't if you don't. Only so much time in the day after all. I don't care if people love something I hate. It doesn't doesn't do anything to me. Uh, it's fine. My hope is that this post will spark s substantive discussion among Star Trek fans everywhere. 
I post. So if you stick around, feel free to chime in too. Feel free to chime in in a comment response to this video or to respond to this comment, by the way. As always, I only watch each episode once, so some nonsense I'm mentioning might be answered before the credits roll. Finally, please support this YouTube channel. I merely litter their <laughs> comment section with nonsense, but it's the content creators who put in the real effort, so like it, subscribe to it, ding a -ling that bell, and help it grow already. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Thanks in advance for your time. Spoilers. Look at the professionalism of this writing. What in the world? We open with Cadet Uhura narrating her personal log entry against the background of a send-off party. Both she, Cadet Chia, uh, have completed their assignments on the Enterprise. Normally, I'd be pointing out yet another scene that opens with slow motion and or behind the furniture, but I confess there is a delicacy to this cinematography that has been absent throughout most of the season before now. Yeah, old Star Trek has a simple, dry, workman-like cinematography that... I kind of miss, but I see what the increased budget, wanting to get more uh, film-like, wanting to get more more of a visual narrative going, doing slow-mo scenes, and uh, putting in um, music into the scene with lyrics that um, are not occurring in reality. You know, like, it's different to have a piece of music playing somewhere in the scene than it would be to have it playing over the scene itself, you know, diegetic, non-diegetic that kind of thing. Feel free to look that up. I'm not really there for it. I'm not into I'm not into music, especially recent music played over the episode and I'm not I'm not into the whole slow-mo thing, but I understand the temptation. Okay. Uh, so too has a semblance that this is a lived-in ship. Yeah, full of crew members going about their duties. So for this episode to focus so heavily on them is actually rather refreshing. It is. I like that. I like when we see, um, you know, the other crew members. Uhura emphasizes that this crew is made up of the top everyone of everything. Again, this is refreshing to hear, especially since much of the season seems to have lost sight of this fact, with most of these characters actually saying or doing things counter to being the best of the best, often to the point where one questions their competencies. Where has this humble self-reflection been all season? I like it a lot. True. A subtle moment that you... Miss if you blink. Number one gestures to Pike that there is time ticking. Okay, as in, let's get this moving along already. Again, this is the logistical side of being the first officer aboard a starship shining through. True. This entire season, I've pointed out how lackadaisical Pike has been, often shirking responsibility and making some of the least informed decisions I've ever seen. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, this... This is like... We're we're further we're in the into the timeline now, right? Like you don't you don't have a lot of um, excuses left, right? Like this is an enterprise, okay? So Pike, yeah, he's he's often making uninformed decisions, and he's often his response to things. He comes off very nonchalant to very serious things. I find he, it's the schmaltz and the, and and the charisma. That's what it is. They're just lathering it on a little too thick. And it makes him look, like you said, lackadaisical. There is no doubt in my mind who runs this ship. It's Una, and rightfully so. She is the steady-handed, stern leader that keeps this vessel moving as well as it does. Yeah, I don't know about that whole claim, though, calling her, like, not fun, or where fun goes to die. I don't know. She seems kind of fun. But yeah, you're right. Pike is all about delegation, unless it's drinks. Una is the captain behind the captain. I wish she could... <laughs> she occupied top seat more often than she does. That would be nice, maybe. You know, Pike goes on an away mission and we get to see Captain Una. That'd be cool. Also, do you think it's interesting that there's two people on the bridge here whose name starts with a U? Uhura and Una? This is an interesting interesting point for you. Uh, Uhura is the most inconsistently written character on this show. Yeah, it's because nobody is writing TOS Uhura. Everybody's just trying to write Kelvin Timeline Uhura. Uh, Uhura is the most inconsistently written character on the show. We are finally seeing her questioning her future motivations again. Something we haven't seen since Johnny Bravo's last... Re <laughs> 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 
Something we haven't seen since Johnny Bravo's last Rift Fest party. <laughs> the comic bike Johnny Bravo. Oh my god. That's perfect. It, I realize why that's perfect. Uh, the captain is Johnny Bravo. <laughs> I don't know why Uhura's dialogue over the season wasn't prepared with this lack of inspiration, but I'm glad to see it has returned. Working lunch seems to follow a priority one mission from Starfleet Command. As the show continues to find its feet in season two and beyond, this is a sort of banter I hope really gets pulled back. I appreciate that the show wants to color in moments of levity here and there, but enough already. I'm kind of in agreement. This is a paramilitary style ship. Let's roll up our sleeves a bit more and tone it down on the team building. I think they're just overcompensating. They're overcompensating based on fan response to the previous two seasons having like combative characters that had nothing to do but cry you know what i mean discovery so they wanted to pepper in more scenes of characters having one-on-one -on -one with each other that was emotionally productive without crying so they wanted small talk they wanted to have a family they didn't want us to just believe they were a family based on what they said they wanted us to actually feel it so i think that's where that's coming from but you're totally right there is a little bit too much of it <clears throat> take it. Uh, take for instance this moment. The chief of security saunters in late to the meeting, blurting out snide comments about the head shrinker. Do we have a priority one mission to review or not? The crew of the Peregrine might all be dead or dying, but sure, let's make certain Singh has her waffles. Yeah. It's like, you just showed up, you just showed Una urging Pike to keep things moving at the party, and yet the show literally undermines that sense of urgency in the very next scene. True. Sure, saying, let's make sure you get that extra cheese, Mercy. Yeah, they do just start eating and talking about the food. And Meanwhile, something has happened to the USS Peregrine. Kind of a big deal. USS Peregrine is a somber class ship, and Benga indicates, indicates that the somber class ship is fast, considering the Peregrine Falcon is the fastest animal on Earth. I'd say it's aptly named. I don't know anything about Earth animals, so thanks for pointing that out. Uh, wait. I'm legitimately confused as to the Priority 1 mission from Starfleet. If the last communication with the Peregrine came as it initiated an emergency landing, communication that was then abruptly cut off, then how does Starfleet even know that the ship survived the landing, a landing that was four days ago? I don't know. Uh, maybe, uh, well, ships have a recorder on them, right? It's kind of like a black box, but we called it a recorder. And it... It may, have, it may include information as to the integrity of the structure of the ship, right? And that could have been, that could have been sent um, inadvertently as a, as a piggyback signal along with communications that they were having with the Peregrine. Could have been, right? Um, wh why is this the second Starfleet outpost this season that needs the resources to be delivered by the Enterprise just as their current supply is on the brink of running out? Right. First, it was the atmosphere processor urgently needed by the colony back in Episode 4. Now it's Vidium power cells for Deep Space Station K7. Who was in charge of logistics at Starfleet Command? Why is it so last minute before these outposts receive their supplies? This better not be another Gorn episode. <laughs> this better not be another Gorn episode, or else I might be convinced that they have an informant planted within Starfleet Command with knowledge of upgrade schedules. Wouldn't that be cool if, like, next season they reveal that there was some spy and that's why all this was happening, like they knew when things were going to run out. Uh, the actual reason is probably just because they need to come up with some exciting reason for why the Enterprise needs to do what it needs to do. Probably. And they just couldn't come up with something different, so they just kind of did it again. It's probably what it was. Pike opts to kill two peregrines with one stone. Haha. <laughs> Sending number one to K7 while he opts to take an away mission to Valeo Beta 5 an L-class planet, with cadets for some reason. I thought that was strange, too, that the cadets come along. Again, can't help but think that the captain is making yet another bad decision in a season full of them. Need I remind you they don't even know if the ship or crew survived the emergency landing. If there is a chance the Peregrine crew is injured or the ship can fly again, then this, then this away, then this away should be full of medical officers and engineers, not cadets. Yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. Two shuttles make their way to the surface, landing nowhere close to the Peregrine for some reason. Again, drama. 
Is there any reason why the Sombra class starship looks like a Constitution class starship? I know Mbenga mentioned that it uses Constitution class parts, but I can't help but think the art department didn't get the approval or time or budget to design an entirely new ship. Something all fans appreciate. Yeah, my favorite thing in the world is these ships, and I was so disappointed by that, I could not give this episode a good review. He calls something some cool name like the Sombra class, and I was expecting some cool kit bash of these new Constitution class parts. And I didn't get it. I just got something that is almost indistinguishable from the Constitution class. In fact, it may be indistinguishable. It may be the exact same model. But, uh... Color me disappointed. I take it back. The shuttles do have a reason to land so far away from the Peregrine. Geothermal anomalies. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Spock. You know what a geothermal, geothermal anomaly is? That's called drama. In writing school, they call that drama. <laughs> they call that inventing drama. Uh, Hemmer is living his best life. I dig it. Just like Andoria. I fell in love with this character. And then they ripped my heart out of my chest and squeezed it until all the blood came out in this episode. Spock refers to Lieutenant Duke as Ensign, and apparently that means that he has to buy Duke a drink. I'm not sure, so sure this is much a tradition of Starfleet as much as a tradition on Johnny Bravo's ship. Nice to see Sam Kirk again. Can't wait to see him nearly get killed again this episode. Yeah, whenever Sam Kirk is here, you know, it's just to dunk on him. It's just to have a comic relief character. It's just for jokes. He's just... He gets to be the butt monkey. I don't know why. Uh, Sing spots what appears to be a human body on the surface. Again, for all Starfleet knows, the entire crew is dead. Credit this show, credit show this episode is, okay, well, credit show this episode is written by Davy Perez. If I'm not mistaken, he also wrote episode four. I guess he just really likes his outposts, need resources immediately, trope for whatever reason. Oh man, this episode better not have the Gorn, or I'm telling you, it'll feel like there's an informant at Starfleet Command divulging logistic secrets to them. I see that this episode is directed by Christopher J. Byrne. It feels like the first episode that Akiva Goldsman directed. The first episode is hands down the best directed episode of the entire season, and this is a close second. Uh, yeah, I'm one of those people who was like good with the first episode. I know a lot of people didn't like it, but I'm I'm down with the first episode for some reason. I don't know why. This guy is really talented with craftsmanship like this. Kurtzman and Goldsman need to hire him to helm the entire second season. Yeah, definitely they need to get a need to get a hold of good. Um, good craftsman. Uh, that's that's the key thing with this new Star Trek people. They need to get in the good directors and the good writers. Um, I was critical of her accompanying this mission, but her insights into communications are proving useful. Pike is almost as surprised as I am as he states, clearly I brought the right people for the job. Apparently he did. I just wish it felt like the daftness... I just wish it felt like da- deafness... As opposed to luck. I almost read that as daftness. Which is uh, daft. Uh, isn't me or is Pike less nonplussed by 20 Peregrine crew members, including the captain of Parish? Yeah, no one gave a crap about the Peregrine in this episode. You notice that? It felt like they just didn't really care the entire episode. Uh, the, the Peregrine, loss of the Peregrine and its crew, like, it felt like no one cared and it felt like it had no bearing on anything. I don't know why, I just get that perception from the episode, just as you have. Uhura assesses, or accesses, the log of the Peregrine craft, and the dialogue is a bit clumsy, and the voice performance is a bit wooden, but the solid cinematography more than makes up for it. Gorn. I can't believe I called that. I blame the writer Perez, telegraphing the same resource-limited scenario that he invoked in this last Gorn episode. He got the two Gorn episodes, did he? Interesting. Why is Pike asking Singh on what she wants to do? Dude, you're the captain. You need to make these tactical decisions. Deferring to Singh's judgment undermines your aptitude as a a character. Yeah, and as a captain. I I would say ultimately I'm disappointed in Pike this season. He had a few moments, but most of the time he's taken a back seat and his worst moments are when he neglects to defend the Federation from... From ne'er do wells, I'd say. Seems a bit strange that Pike would allow Uhura to take the lead when entering the next unsecured room with an alien humanoid with unclear intentions, no less. 
very dangerous. Um, and in my review, I was extremely skeptical of her uh, being on point for that mission. It seems we found the human girl to go along with the humanoid. Obvious question is, had these two managed to survive the initial blast set off by their Orion travel companion, Pesco, and the subsequent Gorn encounters? Well, they hid in the vents, obviously. <laughs> They're using the vents. Uh, no travel. Duke didn't c come himself because the writers need you and Spock to have yet another force scene together. Really hope this stops in season two. Agreed. Conversely, this scene between Hemmer and her is most welcome. Hemmer is easily becoming the most interesting character on this show. It is somewhat ironic that Uhura laments a role in Starfleet as akin to coasting, when we know too well that Nichelle Nichols' time in the role unfortunately gave her little to do. Yeah, I know. Like, you're exactly right. Sing starts to berate Oriana. Where are the Gorn? Seems like a silly thing to ask. How would she know? I, I was, uh, I was aghast at Sing's performance when she was talking to that girl. It was way out of line. And, uh, it looked like she was just going to start shaking the kid for answers. That's a great idea, right? Maybe she's not good with kids. And Benga, uh, references his daughter. I like that he does. Makes a lot of sense. Makes far less sense as Sing would barely notice the odd choice of words, though. Yeah. Uh, okay, and Benga is now actually referencing his daughter to Sing. Apparently she knows who she is for some reason. Yeah, there was a lot of confusion around who knew about his daughter and the transporter buffer, who didn't, who was in on the scheme. If you ask me, everything to do with his daughter is a little bit harebrained. It's a little, it's a little weak. I didn't need it. Um, with all the flickering lights, dead bodies, open vents, and deadly creatures around, you'd think I'd have made a Nostromo reference by now, but alas, it took the little Gorn bursting from the humanoid's body for me to see the alien flick comparison. Uh, yeah. <sighs> Part 2. Why did Oriana cover her mouth, I wonder? I don't know, maybe she was just trying to, like, stop herself from breathing? Maybe, maybe you hold your hand over your mouth, it's like, you're making less noise. Apparently the alien vibes aren't enough monster movie references. We also seem to need a Predator-style POV shot as well. I know. We see things from the from the Gorn's point of view, and it looks totally different than what we saw in Star Trek Enterprise. There was a shot in Enterprise where we saw a Gorn, like, looking out from a Gorn's eyes, and, and saw what the Gorn saw, and it didn't look anything like this. Uh, not gonna lie, I... I chuckled at Kirk chastising Duke for having touched something that could have killed him. Yeah. This could have been this could have been a great episode if we actually like like we played it straight. Like imagine if we set this up like Alien, but then we asked ourselves what would happen if Starfleet was there? <laughs> and we just see the creatures just get destroyed because Starfleet can obviously defeat unintelligent animals. Like, that would be actually kind of funny if it was, like, meta. But they didn't. They went, like, they went into the genre and had their characters devolve into horror movie characters. It was sick. Uh, okay, so Duke apparently bites the dust, or rather gets bitten. I gotta say, this entire series has made it fairly evident that this show doesn't know how to stage compelling live-action sequences. Sadly, this scene will not buck that trend either as four crew members seem entirely useless when it comes to stopping Duke from being dragged off. Also, why aren't they running after him to see if he's still alive? I know, they just kind of let him go, and just assume he's dead. You don't know what the Gorn did to him, really. Do you really know? Really? Maybe he's still alive somewhere. Pike says we need to alert the rest of the crew, right now. Uh, alert them of what? Didn't they all know that Gorn was possibly running all over the place? Yeah, they were all there for the initial briefing that the uh, last captain gave before she uh, bit the dust. Sing starting chapel actually gave Sing startling chapel actually gave me a jump scare. Nice. Why doesn't Starfleet tech detect the Gorn? First, the Peregrine captain said that biofilters missed them, and now tricorders can't locate their biosigns. I'm telling you, there is a Gorn mole who has infiltrated Starfleet. 
that maybe that would be cool for season two if they did it right. Um, back to Hemmer and Uhura. Not gonna lie, I suddenly find myself wondering how tough a hide Hemmer's skin makes. Yeah, he does look he does look rough. Team Hemura strikes again. Find the producer that signed off on that line and fired. <laughs> yeah. These little quips, these little human 20th century style quips that the characters make. Uh, we do an awful lot of work to make it look like we're in the future. But then when it comes to the writing, we're right back in 21st century, baby. Let me tell you. Hemmer smells human blood. Putting aside the fact that he knows what it smells like, why is this a shocker? There's human blood everywhere, including at the entrance where they first bore the peregrine. He should have said, I smell human blood, fresh human blood. Still creepy, but at least sends, uh, lends itself better to the urgency of the moment. True. True. I think maybe, maybe Hemmer knew that, and he was just simplifying the statement. Like, we all know what he's supposed to think when he says he smells human blood. Right? Like, we know what that's supposed to mean. So maybe we were left to infer. Right? And that, and he did that on purpose. But yeah, it would be cooler if we said, I smell fresh human blood. That would be more interesting and more accurate. Again, a lot of these things you can fix with a small script change and alleviate a lot of problems. This is one of them. Sam Kirk is losing it. Not that I blame him. But if Pike wasn't such a pushover, a stern talking uh, to might snap the lieutenant back into focus. Exactly. Pike says he wounded one of the Gorn. Did I miss something? He shot wildly at Duke's body, but I didn't see him wound one of the Gorn. Seriously, did something get cut out again? Hire a dedicated stunt coordinator. A show of this kind of budget needs to make this a priority for season two. Buddy, if you had a scene... Uh, I, I, you probably watched Picard season two. Man, there was some action in that. that it, looked like, it looked like high schoolers. There was some... This is at least better than that. But yeah, you're right. It's, we just, it feels like we don't really want to, it feels like we want to have our characters locked down and in place a lot and not really get into contact with things because we're scared of how it's going to look. A lot of these things tell me we're not confident of our um, prop design or CGI. So finally, Pike has the ability to alert the crew and this is all this information he gives them. Get to sick bay. Great details on the threat they're facing, Captain. Oh, wow. Okay. So, apparently, that is what a Gorn looks like in this show, eh? Looks like a cross between a Zindi insectoid and the Geico Gecko. Yeah, or some kind of species 8472 thing from Voyager, something like that. Um, hopefully, I got the digits correct in that name. Um, Uhura doesn't immediately shoot the Gorn. Instead, she takes the time to state, we need to make a run for it. This, of course, leads to Hammer getting puked all over by the Geico Gecko. Uhura is literally the worst part of the team. Uhura is the worst part of Team Hamura, and there's only two, so one of them's going to be worse. Um, apparently the Geico Gecko pukes, puke burns. Seems we will see how thick a hide Hammer has after all. Kirk goes off on Spock. Maybe someone told Kirk that Spock didn't so much as bat an eyelash when he nearly died in the Shepard Comet, and he is still bitter about it. This pep talk, pep talk from Pike sucks. The guy seriously sounds like he can't be bothered with the situation. He can't. A lot of times... He, he had a few good scenes early on where he was uh, interacting with crew members to kind of, like, bring them up onto the level they needed to be. And he just kind of forgot about that in the last, like, 70% of the show. He just kind of went out the window. Sing, Singh says they wouldn't have a chance against even one adult Gorn. Wrong. They would. I'm confused. Wasn't that actually an adult Gorn that... She just fired upon and chased away. Aren't the younglings the smallest ones that burst out of the humanoid? She said there was four of those. One was already dead. The Geico Gecko just squashed one. So there are only two left, plus the adult. She just got the upper hand on. No, why doesn't she Why doesn't she think they could stand up to if, if, if she literally just did? I... <sighs> guys, guys, it's just the Gorn. Like everything we've seen, they're not... We can beat them. Like, it's not... Don't worry about it. Like, it's... I don't know. what These writers had some other idea going on in their mind about the Gorn, but it just... Uh, 
Where is Newt? I mean Mbenga's daughter. I mean Oriana. <laughs> Sing, uh, Sing says they need to use aggressive behavior to draw them out. Uh, literally no one was using aggressive behavior prior to this and they all were drawn out pretty well. She then also states the Gorn hate the cold. Yes, we learned that already. Hence the bodies of the crew outside apparently trying to lure them out into the elements. So here's a question, Miss Tactical Genius. Tactical Analysis. Sorry. I extrapolated based on incomplete information. So here's a question, Miss Tactical Analysis. Don't you think the Peregrine crew would have thought to lure them on board the ship too? Maybe you should ascertain whether or not they did make such an attempt. Uh, if so, did it work? And Benga comments that Pike still hasn't changed his command codes. Now, why would he do something responsible like that, Doc? It's not really on brand for him, is it? Strange, strange little line in that sh episode, isn't it? But not changing the command code. Like, I wonder why they left that in there. Hemmer says he would he won't kill the Gorn, but will do what he must to protect the lives of his crew. So maybe you will kill it after all. Abracadabra, you're dead, Geico Gecko. Yeah, Hemmer, we just we needed more time. We needed more time to explain this character's philosophy on that and what that all means. And Pike declares it's going into the vent systems, so apparently we can track it now with the ship sensors. Spock goes full Rambo. Seems odd, considering Uhura didn't have to. Sing conveniently suggests that the two Geico geckos that are dueling one another will somehow both perish. I guess it's impossible for one of them to kill the other. Nope. Okay, then. Uh, great insights from Miss Tactical Analysis. This is just a friendly reminder for the crew. You have no proof that there isn't already several adult Gorn hiding somewhere, either on the ship or in a cave system on the planet's surface, or maybe even back in your shuttles. <gasps> Miss Tactical Analysis so she seems to think throwing her weapon away makes sense. Couldn't she just have handed it off to one of the other crew members on the other side of the door she just came from? I bet Rambo Spock would be appreci would appreciate a phaser instead of whatever he's, the heck he's holding. Uh, yeah, he's holding some kind of pipe or something. Uh, not exactly a Lerpa. Uh, now I'm no Miss Tactical Analysis, but I still don't understand why the crew couldn't have just huddled somewhere, say, on the bridge, and couldn't have simply chilled the rest of the ship, you know, freeze them all with one go. At least that way you could theoretically exterminate any other Geico geckos that you might not have accounted for. Yeah, I could think of a million ways to defeat the, the Gorn in this episode that they never thought of. It's My initial instinct when I reviewed this episode was just to run. You know, okay, everybody's dead. You know they're dead. You got the human girl. My idea would just be to run back to the shuttle. And you see Gorn coming. You phaser them. Uh, yeah, that's that was my idea. Um, ah, oh, look at that frozen Geico Gecko. Hope he had insurance. It's dead, Chris. Why does Pike look and sound like he just woke up from a bad acid flashback? Uh, Kirk rejoices that they've gotten rid of the last of them. If we're still keeping with the whole alien vibes, there should be one waiting for you back on the shuttle. You sons of bitches. You've infected Hemmer. Literally the most interesting character on this damn show. I was livid about that. I was... This is the episode... As I was watching this episode, I had to get up and walk around multiple times. I was so angry with it. Now you're telling me he's got to walk off into the sunset for the last time. Are you freaking kidding me? Wow, as if I didn't need another reason to dislike Uhura. Hemmer is an absolute stud. <laughs> uh... Spock clocking Hemmer's sacrifice is a nice touch, not heavy-handed, but those that know, know. Hemmer gives one last piece of advice to Uhura. Open yourself. It's a touching moment. Even if the choice of words are unfortunate, given that he's about to experience, yeah, he's about to experience death. And open yourself. It's one of those, it's such a bland nonsense, like, kind of like, it's like when you go to the doctor, and the doctor says to drink more water. Lie down, drink water. Yeah, of course, open yourself. It's just, like, it's not, it's not, it's not biting and surgical enough for me to, like, get anything out of it. It's very discovery to just say, open yourself, be open, be nice. That's it, I guess.
Did you enjoy our team building? Uh huh. Wink, wink. Enjoy the view, Blue Skin. This crew, this show, won't be the same without you, pal. It won't be. This scene is the best thing Ortegas has done uh, on this show. Wow, she suddenly has such depth. More of this, please. Hammer's purpose to fix what is broken. Combined with this solid cinematography, I'm telling you, sign this director long term immediately. Yeah. Spock's a fixed stare at Chapel. Chills. This is the first time all season that I actually wanted Chapel to chase after Spock for a scene between the two of them. It's actually an earned moment between uh, them. Yeah. I often criticize Peck for being too closed off vocally. It's clear to me now that this actor uh, accesses anger far easier than any other emotion. I say this because this moment is the best performance Peck has given to date. I'm not particularly in love with Peck Spock. Um, he's a little bit too one note. But yeah, I see what you're saying here. That was the first time I believed the chemistry from Chapel towards Spock. Hire this director long term immediately. Singh is departing Enterprise to help Oriana find family. The direction is top notch. I can't go over it. He knows exactly where he wants the camera, and he knows exactly how to get the best out of these actors, including Chong, who also gives her per first, per sorry, her best performance of her season with this goodbye. A missed opportunity to have Pike reflect on his decision to include Cadet Chia and Lieutenant Duke. Names that should haunt him moving forward, you'd think, you know, you'd think he would have constant flashbacks of this, as he does with those people in the future he's going to kill, you know, if he cannot change the future. We close with Uhura as she overlooks the position she used to find, <coughs> sorry, she's destined to serve at Cinematography is Beautiful. Yeah, she is destined to be on the Enterprise, we know that. Conclusion. This was the best episode of the season, and easily the best in New Trek which is to say the best Star Trek I've seen since 2005. Not perfect, Ben's canon needs better action choreography, bores heavily from other sci-fi properties, and still depicts Pike as the most useless captain I've ever seen, but really well done overall. I disagree. For those that have followed my previous pedantic posts, you'll be just as shocked as I am that I like this episode as much as I did. Score 7 out of 10. Not, mm, it wasn't for me, it was... I don't know, I need the slow weird sci-fi concept Star Trek with with cool ships. This is this just didn't have it for me. Um I I see cinematography like is what you're looking for here and you know what it's achieving cinematically works. It's got the visuals, but for me uh this is not the best Star Trek since 2005 for me. My favorite Star Trek for 2005 is probably Inside Prodigy somewhere. It's probably A Moral Star Part 1. It's probably my favorite piece of Star Trek since Enterprise. Uh, score 7 out of 10. And there you can see um, uh, Michael Strathmore's uh, rubric for how he reviews things, if you're interested in that. Uh, there you go. Um Thanks a lot, Michael Strathmore. I really appreciate the effort you're putting in here with these reviews. I mean, this is written way better than I review, really. Like, if there was a way you could convert this yourself into a video review, I'm sure it would do okay. Um, thanks a lot. Um, Undertaker 45 uh, for Strange New World Season 1, Episode 9. So this week it's the Gorn. This, this week it's Khan. Gorn, Khan, Gorn. Oh, look. Dr. Sung, see Star Trek, funniest review yet, I was cracking up. Yeah, if New Trek definitely smacks of. All right, boys, what do we got? Well, there's Khan, uh, there's Gorn, uh, there's Romulans, and there's Borg. Okay, let's get it done, right? They don't really want to have the new aliens. They just want to have the same villains over and over and over again. So props to Discovery for actually going to the future and having new things happen. Props, where props are due. But I'm tired of seeing the same thing over and over again. Even this is tech, even if this is technically a prequel to TOS, you know, still. Thanks, Undertaker. Uh, I am not a Nugget Blackheart again, returning uh, for Season 1, Episode 9. That smacking Kurtzman part looks so wrong, and the way he creeped down afterwards. LMAO. <laughs> uh... Undertaker 45 for episode 8. 
Strange New World Season 1. So what exactly is your function on the bridge? It, If you can sit there and review 21st Century TV, maybe why you haven't made Lieutenant Commander. <laughs> Thanks, Undertaker. Uh, I like that people are getting in on... Um, getting in on the shtick here. Uh, what am I talking about? It's not a shtick. It's my life. Uh, what I do on the bridge, I'm a, I'm a field engineer, and I'm also a engineer's mate. Uh, what that means is that I operate the, um, like the operations console kind of, on the bridge, uh, for one of my shifts, and nothing ever happens, right? Because the ship doesn't really do anything, okay? So I'll do one shift, like we do an A, B, C, D shift, right? I'll do one shift in engineering, right? Where I, uh, I just assist the chief engineer. And then uh, in field engineer, which I have on another shift, I go up to the bridge and I look at the uh, engineering detachment console, or some would call it operations. And I just look at everything that's going on there. I might glance at the master system display. But mostly I don't do anything. And when I'm not doing anything, the captain has allowed me to review ancient Earth media. Isn't it great? It works for both of us. And yeah, I do waste a lot of time, and I'm not very good, and that's why I'm not I'm not being promoted very much. <laughs> okay. Michael Strathmore again for episode eight, Strange New World, season one. Hello. The following are my real time reactions as I watch Star Trek Strange New World, season one, episode eight, The Elysian Kingdom. <clears throat> uh Hmm, okay, so this intro to this, it feels like it was it's a like like a, a copied from the previous one, like he has like a format. So I'm not gonna read the first part again. Um you can read it here if you're interested, or you can re rewind this review, uh this this comment review video to read what he was saying originally. Uh so thanks in advance for your time, everybody. This episode opens with a personal log entry from Mbenga, where he laments about the downtime he currently has. I can't help but think that these Nurse Chapel, that with Nurse Chapel having so much pr prominence in the series, the Chief Medical Officer has unfortunately had a lot of downtime in this show. A lot of Chapel in this show. It's kind of weird. Uh, and Benga confesses he has made little to no progress on his daughter. Did the data provide to him from the first servant's father not help at all? Or was Mbenga unable to understand the theory enough to make any headway? Maybe. Maybe a little bit of both. Not to knock the kid, but is there anything in her performance that gives us the impression that she has any more sick than any other time when, she's, when we saw her? No, she's mostly the same. Rukia pleads with Mbenga to finish the story, because the writers can't help but foreshadow that this episode will be about, I'm guessing, rather than do so. The pressed for time doctor need, uh, reveals reads from chapter two instead of the ending. Yeah. I've been saying this since the series began. I'm going to say it again. I think the actor playing in Benga has been subtly turning into one of the... I said that too. I said that multiple episodes ago. I said his performance is actually really good. He he delivers a really good physical performance. You can like tell what he's thinking by how he's moving. It's He's really good. Um, the character of Mbenga is not that wonderful so far but the performance is great i really like the guy playing him i know that may sound odd given his lack of screen time and i know anson mount gets all the attention for his chops as he should but i've been watching babs okay ola san Mokin. i'm gonna pronounce it like that i forgive me i don't really watch behind the scenes things with these actors as as the show's just coming out so i'm gonna call him ola san Mokin like a hawk since this show began, and I see what he's been doing. It's actually lovely work. It is. I've been saying that. Uh, speaking of characters without nearly enough screen time, I also want to give a shout-out to number one here as well. I believe that the show has done a great disservice to a character missing the mark as to why I think most fans have wanted to gravitate towards her in the first place, yet couldn't always quite get there. There have been glimpses where we've seen her portrayed as the logistical leader that we're, we've grown to expect from her first officer in Starfleet, especially on the flagship. Her knowledge of the vessel, the crew, and her ability to run it as the executive officer have been exactly what this character needs and what the fan base has been missing out on in general. Instead, the writers have spent too much time portraying Una in whimsical situations of fun. Those are okay, too, but when the most of the crew is also depicted as lighthearted 
as it gets in Star Trek. It leaves unglamorous logistical itch that makes up the nuts and bolts of running a ship left unscratched for me. Okay. Reminding the doctor of his duties, thus placing the needs of a ship ahead of the personal need with his daughter is exactly what I'm talking about. More of this, please. She isn't heartless. She is responsible and accountable. And responsibility plus accountability is what this show lacks from its crew thus far. Perhaps. Despite the fact that we've seen other medical personnel on this ship, including individuals I assume were doctors, apparently only the chief medical officer can clear the shuttle crew for active duty. Is this not something that can be delegated to someone else? Or perhaps, if I'm not mistaken, an Mbenga is literally the only doctor aboard? I don't think so. Why am I not surprised that Pike is already thinking about happy hour? Dude literally is the least hands-on captain in all of Starfleet. I can get used to this. This is really just code for him getting used to doing as little as possible. It's not like he's doing any science himself. Practically everything he laments to Spock over battles and chaos only ever come about as a result of his decision-making and lack of sound judgment. Most challenges are solved by other crew members, not him. But sure, drinks on you, rib-fest Johnny Bravo. Scans indicate a what, Mr. Spock. Techno babble is hard enough, but Peck continuing to garble his lines isn't helping. I said this before and I'll repeat it now. Dude sounds like my Greek cousin, complete with accent. Literally had to rewind and use closed captioning to understand what a scan showed. Spock suggests that they engage impulse thrusters. Uh, what? Do you want to engage impulse engines or the thrusters? There are two separate things. Yes, a thruster is not really like the, the impulse engine. There's the main impulse drive, and then there's thrusters around the ship, right? A thruster is what you do to orient the ship, and, uh, like... Uh, maybe it's just one of these weird, not sure about things, but, um, like, there's the impulse drive. Can you see that thing, like, back, um, behind the saucer? See that little section right there? That's the impulse engines. Just so we're clear, um... Why is Ortega suddenly standing, lol? Oh, I see, Ortega is standing just so the show can depict her falling to the ground. Sigh, nothing like smart officers being depicted as making dumb decisions, am I right? Why, hit it when you can eat it. Yeah, as in, eat the dirt. Um, if, the ca uh, if the captain truly thought Ortega's injury was a medical emergency, then why didn't he beam her to sick bay using the emergency medical transporter that we've confirmed that we have? We have the emergency medical transporter. It would seem the plume of medical smoke that Mbenga inhaled, and probably the Janisian nebula, is making the doctor hallucinate. One would hope. Bless. The director thinks we need a flash of Mbenga's novel shoehorned into this moment to help us understand what's just transpired, as if we're 12 year olds or didn't read the name of the episode. <clears throat> well, I wasn't expecting a malfunctioning holodeck-like episode. So many questions. Is this all in Mbenga's mind? Is he unconscious back in sickbay? Didn't everyone else see what Mbenga sees? Is Ortega's knocked out? This is the first time I haven't liked Anson Mount's performance. Granted, I haven't all enjoyed the choices made by the writers for this character, but until now, I was able to still separate those character choices from the fact that he was doing a great job as a skilled actor. But now it's a little too much of Anson Mount chewing up the scenery and not enough whatever the dude's name is. It's just a little too Saturday morning cartoons for my liking. Yeah, Pike is a Saturday morning captain. What can I say? Okay, wow. So Christina Chong got whiff of Mount's cartoonish performance and decided to up the ante with this ridiculous pantomime-like portrayal. Subtly, this could probably be seen all the way from Earth. Yeah. Bah, kudos to the audio team for adding Runa licking Singh in post. <laughs> Yeah, the dog did liquor. That was kind of weird. Apparently, Hemmer is also unaffected. No dopamine for him, I guess. Sing decides to sing. This really is a pantomime after all. At least it wasn't as long as Ag Borg's cringe-inducing so <laughs> Don't bring that up. I don't want to talk about that. Call me crazy, but maybe the king could have grabbed a phaser or something? Just in case this meeting with the queen goes south. You know... I can't help but feel that the stakes in this particular episode are absent. It, I said the exact same thing in my review. 
I said that I, I and when I reviewed this, I just skipped over most of the plot. A lot of the plot does not fundamentally matter in this episode. I can't help but feel that the stakes in this particular episode are absent. If the writers knew what they were doing this season, they would have layered in a plot deal about between Mbenga and his daughter, whereby they never actually finish the book they're reading, make it because she doesn't want it to end, and prefers to make up her own endings instead. That way it would make this episode more relevant, because Mbenga doesn't know the ending of the story, and therefore isn't as confident on how to proceed. Instead we get this, a story he knows <coughs> by rote. Yes, indeed. He knows his future, similar to Pike. Look, I know this story is meant to be ridiculous, but even in this nonsense, Mount can't help but upstage his co-stars. It's a shitty thing for an actor to do, especially when the episode doesn't revolve around him. With claws like that, I'm going to assume the queen uses a bidet, or has a servant with the worst job in the Elysian Kingdom. Part 2 Yup, a phaser would be handy right now, but at least Hemmer isn't empty-handed. Sir Roth isn't exactly known for his bravery. At least he and Pike have that in common. Drinks in Castle are on Sir Roth, everyone. Indeed. Una Hood shows up and shoots two of the crew members to the point where they collapse from their wounds. Meanwhile, despite their serious injuries, Mbenga wants this fantasy to end before someone gets seriously hurt. Well, maybe it's a little late for that, Mbenga. Some less than subtle innuendo between Una Hood and Ortega suggests that the two might be lovers in this fantasy, which is interesting considering that Rukia seems to have conjured this aspect of the story. Yeah, um, Rukia had invented the idea that they teamed up, and that became part of the story. Wink, wink. Uh, Spock is hiding in plain sight of Nurse Chapel and Ortega, who are about ten feet away in sick bay. I know, I know. There's moments where characters discuss something in private with somebody standing right beside them. Pike betrays Mbenga once again, and some phasers will do them good right about now. Rukia no longer has her disease. I know this is supposed to be a nice moment, but really, it's completely unearned. Yeah. This is what destroys this episode, the ending. It gets so bad by the end, it's just unbelievable. Wait, wait, just stop. Are you trying to tell me that Mbenga, who only just met with his alien nebula life form, was just okay to hand Rukia over without so much as batting an eyelash? Dude, you just got the data from the first servant. Maybe bringing it to Starfleet Medical could get, you know, whole swaths of medical experts working on this. Your career might be in jeopardy, but the reality is that you have no idea what relinquishing your daughter this alien will mean for her long term. Yes, we see this contrived scene with Rukia as an adult, but it doesn't change the fact that Mbenga didn't know what her fate would be when he turned her over. Heck, for all we know, all he knows, this is an alien disguise telling him what he wants to hear exactly. How did we know, right? Abracadabra, the ship returns to normal and no crew has memory of what happened. Hemmer complains about a headache. Speaking of headaches, is Ortega still suffering from a possible brain hemorrhage? Surely we'll find out, right? Oh look, sickbay finally has nurses and doctors again. The surveillance logs are blank. Uh, what now? What? How? Law? Number one visits Mbenga for no reason whatsoever. Unless she came to inform him that the crew of the shuttle escaped their quarantine during the five hours without him clearing them first. And now a new virus is plaguing the ship, or maybe she came to tell him that Ortegas is dead, brain hemorrhage and all. They have no idea how it happened. Maybe I missed it, but exactly why was the doctor <coughs> why wasn't the doctor affected like the rest of the crew exactly? Did they even say? I thought that was Rukia intentionally making Mbenga not experience it. Because she was using the nebula's magical power to make all this happen? I don't know. So is Pike's last memory of Ortega's getting injured right? Is he not wondering why she is fine now, assuming she is fine now? Are we just going to forget that two crew members took what appears to be arrows to their bodies? No one is concerned that they've been bleeding out for hours? They're dead, right? Like, after escaping Una Hood, they went somewhere else and bled out? Man, this episode stunk. I'm inclined to agree. But you've given it a score of 4 out of 10. So thanks a lot, Michael Strathmore. Oh, look, we got an addendum. <clears throat> when it came to the ending with Mbenga, it was just a bridge too far to me to accept that he willingly hand over his daughter after, what, three minutes? As if the doctor forgot that the alien that... The alien flat out insured crew members got shot with arrows. Two crew members that could have that bled out for all we know. Is this really the entity with which you want to place the future of your kid? Remember the last time your crew stumbled upon an alien creature that glorified a kid? 
Remember what happened to him? The former first servant became beef jerky. I'm sorry. I just didn't buy the motivation for why Mbenga would willingly hand over his kid to this unknown entity. What's more frustrating is that this motivation isn't all that difficult to layer in. If you indulge me, this is how you solve the believability of this moment. Okay, let's see this. Imagine that we actually see Mbenga's turmoil in the previous pirate episode. After all, he should have been he should have been beside himself when he and the crew were locked up on the Serene Squall, knowing that he'd never see his daughter again after the pirates commandeered the Enterprise. He's practically wailing in agony, knowing that it's only a matter of time before they find her, and heaven only knows how much they'd make her suffer before her painful death. Yeah. The crew cannot console him, and they don't understand why he is in such agony. Only Una does. And she barks at the crew to give him some room. She cradles him, all the while he can't stop seeing Rukia wake up from the transporter, calling over him only to have some evil pirate menacingly move in on her instead. And Bega can practically hear her screams. And who knows, maybe play out the episode where it isn't just his imagination. A pirate does find her. She barely escapes and against all odds survives in hiding on the vessel. Think Newt from Aliens. But the clock is now ticking on her condition. Yes, the Enterprise crew ultimately reigns control of the ship. Uh, yes, and Benga finds his daughter, who is now traumatized and has even less time due to existing outside the buffer. Make this moment the reason why Mbenga realizes that he cannot merely keep her in the transporter buffer any longer. After all, what if it happens again? Only next time they can't recover the ship next time. He knows he cannot find a cure in time, so at his wits uh, end, and out of pure desperation he agrees to hand Rukia over to this unknown entity. And even after doing so, finish the episode knowing, showing him crying himself to sleep, never knowing if it was the right decision. Voila! That makes the decision to hand Rukia over far more interesting and believable at the end of this episode. Instead, we get this, an alien we've met for three minutes and know nothing about. My idea is way more complicated than that. My idea was to scrap this entire episode and have an episode where Mbenga is transported into um, a planet inside the nebula that is like... 20 years in the future and um, basically he gets to learn about um, how there's no disease there or something and there's something about like um, them offering to transport his daughter there and as she comes there she ages 20 years or something like something like that like I, I want to see Mbenga actually like see the process for how his daughter would live to like understand it like, I thought it was a problem of Mbenga not knowing enough, is how I, I took that. But that's just an inkling of an idea. Um, okay, one second, I need to take a break here for a moment. Hello, the following are my real-time reactions as I watch Star Trek Strange New World Season 1, Episode 7, <coughs> The Serene Squall. Wow, unfortunately this episode is terrible. Another unoriginal, wholly predictable snooze fest that continues to depict Pike as an unserious captain amongst a crew full of inept officers. The show also undermines character moments in previous episodes. It is my least favorite episode of the season. Great. Read if you like. Don't if you don't. Just a reminder, you may like something I don't. Comments meant to be tongue-in-cheek. Yeah, again, thanks for the disclaimer. Michael Strathmore. Um, moving on. <laughs> we open on Ankesh. Okay, I know. I knew I was going to have a hard time pronouncing this. Ankeshtan Ketil, Vulcan Criminal Rehabilitation Center. Try saying that five times fast. Interesting set design. I dig it. Challenge accepted. Ankeshtan Ketil, Ash. Ankeshtan Ketil, Ash. Ankeshtan Ketil, Ankeshtan Ketil, Ankeshtan Ketil. I think that was five. Ankeshtan Ketil. And cash tank deal, and cash tank deal, and cash tank deal. <sighs> Why is Dupree recording a Starfleet style personal log? I don't know. This season loves personal logs. Have you noticed that? How much we love using logs now to introduce episodes? Anyway, she's reflecting on the rehab work she's been doing with these criminals. I wonder how many of them she might have punched to get them there. True. <clears throat> Dupring reads a bunch of human novels that she might better understand Spock's human culture, except Spock barely has a human culture that he himself is in touch with, so I'm not exactly sure 
what she's talking about. I'm sure that Tupin can see the difference between Spock and, say, Pike. Dude was raised on Vulcan. If you've got questions, maybe buy his human mother Amanda lunch sometime. Good idea. Spock is looking for relationship advice. Unfortunately, he goes for, to Chapel, the one person that's given him some of the worst advice an, an individual could receive. Namely, if your partner doesn't like something about yourself, simply hide it away from them. It's ironic that this situation might just be one instance where Pike could be more useful than anyone else aboard the ship since he has plenty of experience, has served with, and knows Spock well, and also knows to pray fairly well as well. Fairly well also, sorry. But nope, we need yet another situation whereby Chapel needs to be shoehorned into the story to help justify her less than subtle feelings for the Vulcan lieutenant. Spock, do you know why it's fun to be friends with Vulcans? I'm going to guess it's so that you won't be the only individual wearing a ridiculous wig in any given room <laughs> when you're with them, t referring to Chapel. Chapel attempts to be funny, exclaiming that Spock needs to pay better attention to me when I'm talking, because before I can vomit, Spock replies with, You're very charming, and I'm completely missing it. I actually said aloud, Oh, F off. First of all, she's not charming, like not remotely. She's needy and whiny, basically a terrible combination that all but ensures she's the least likable individual on the ship. She has such terrible emotional intelligence that she fit right in over on the Discovery. <laughs> yeah, and that is saying something. But it's also ironic that Spock states that this unjustified claim after being told to not to outsmart the truth. I don't know what that line means. Don't try to be smart, smarter than the truth or outsmart the truth. I don't. That's a Discovery line. I don't know what that even means. The amount of scenes that open with a dolly shot appearing behind some random furniture in the room is getting hilarious. Just because you can move the camera doesn't mean you need to, people. Agreed. <clears throat> Dr. Aspen uh, sees why Pike is called Boy Scout by Starfleet. Is anyone else not surprised that the lackadaisical Pike hasn't so much as even read his file? This isn't the seventh this is the seventh episode in a row to depict Pike as the most hands off captain I've ever seen. Had he bothered to do any work, like knowing what's in his file, he wouldn't be surprised to learn of his nickname. At least, his nickname is better than Number One's nickname. The Serene Squall. Fire the writer that came up with that gem of a name. <laughs> Weird, isn't it? Is carrying out some pirating, eh? I guess the writers thought that the Gorn episode wasn't enough when it came to space plundering. Spock asserts that, asserts that <clears throat> the Enterprise would doubtless prove superior to any vessel. Spock apparently forgot that he and the crew barely escaped their lives when the Enterprise suddenly found itself spectacularly outgunned and, out and outsmarted up against the Gorn a few weeks back. Shame on the writers for making Spock look like a forgetful oaf. You see, dang it, Spock isn't wrong. The Enterprise will outgun anything in space. Dang it. <laughs> you shut up saying that the Enterprise is outsmarted by the Gorn. Give me a break, Michael Strathmore. I'm just joking. <clears throat> Pike has read a file. He's done some work. Apparently he's read one on Dr. Aspen. That makes two whole files in seven episodes. I wonder if his reading, in his reading, it came across the ridiculous reason why the writers would name her Aspen as in Asp. Like the deadly snake. Oh, I never thought of that. Sigh. With a name that terrible, I'm just going to go out on a limb now and guess that this is the villain of the week. You're smart. Oh my goodness, these knuckleheads even drew a snake-like shape on Dr. Aspen's face. So Pike doesn't even want to ask Dr. Aspen how they might have come across his nickname. Perhaps the snake has been reading up on Pike in order to play him like a fiddle? I know this was a throwaway line, but my spidey sense continues to tingle with this new friend. Oh man, this episode already smells like it's going to be terrible. Oof, I hope I'm wrong. Oh my goodness. Okay, so Enterprise has arrived at the edge of Federation space, at the location of where the colonists should be. And shocker, the vulnerable colonists are nowhere to be found. Womp womp. And of course, <clears throat> Pike isn't going to wait for Starfleet to officially sanction this mission for the flagship to proceed. That's a complicated issue. Seems silly that Starfleet would send the Enterprise to this region of space and not discuss the contingency of the ship leaving Federation territory. Correct. And we're going to assume that Pike is too dumb to realize that this is all just a ploy to lure the ship to a more vulnerable location so that the snake doctor, snake doctor, <laughs> the snake oil salesman doctor, can pillage the ship with ease. What did the doc say earlier? 
It's really tough convincing ships to come uh, this area of space. Yeah, well, don't fret. Captain Johnny P. Bravo is here. The P stands for prudence. Is there any reason why, in this very critical moment, the first officer failed to make it to the bridge after the risk assessment meeting? Is she worried about missing happy hour? Yeah, she's, she might miss happy hour. You know, she has to go do security things, right? Uh, Pike sends the science officer to call on Dr. Aspen. Is there not an ensign that could be doing this? The pose at the door, though, wiping sweat that isn't even there. Hilarious. Used to club hop during my academy days. Nobody asked because nobody cares. Yeah, this... I don't know the word club hop. It's just something... Something about that is kind of weird. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the Enterprise is getting a distress signal. Seriously. Where is the first officer? Oh, great. The snake doctor even warns Pike it could be pirates. While well, Spock reiterates his warning about entering into this region of space. And yet, once again, Pike acts like the worst captain in Starfleet. This time by virtue signaling that he dare not wait for additional information or approvals. It means, yeah, I thought this was a stupid line. He just said, oh, I'm not going to wait for approval if it means somebody might be sold into slavery. Well, well, I guess you can't wait for anything then, because there's always something horrible happening in space. If he actually acted like this all the time, he'd be running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Because you cannot police the entire universe. But in this case, he needs to break protocol to save people who might be becoming slaves. Might. We didn't know. Okay, so virtue signaling that he dare not wait for additional information or approvals if it means he can chase down a tenuous theory at the expense of his entire ship and crew. That's right, your number one priority is the safety of the ship and crew. Right, Pike? Ortegas is literally flying the Enterprise into asteroids without so much as batting an eyelash. Is there any reason why the deflector dish isn't, you know, deflecting? Yeah, Num one of the number one issues that you'll notice with modern Trek is that they seem to forget about deflecting. They don't seem to understand that ships um, push away, they sweep away debris. We would also call this a particle sweeper. But the deflector is necessary to do anything in space. Because space is actually full of, of micro particles. Okay? That, and if you're going fast enough, can destroy a, a starship. A little pebble can destroy a starship if you're moving fast enough. I don't care how tough your ship is. You need what's called a deflector. So if you fly into a debris field, it gets swept away, right? Okay? Um, now, traditionally, the Constitution class did not have a deflector dish, but it had a, dis a deflector array that surrounded the dish. Okay? And I'm assuming that the Constitution class in this show, Strange New Worlds, has similar technology. Um, and I didn't see any technobabble come up as to why they could not use the deflector but you're pointing it out here. I don't. I don't know why we need this great piece of piloting from Ortegas to get around these asteroids if if we can deflect. But whatever. We needed a line explaining it. Oh look, a trap! Didn't see that coming. If I hear Tholian Web, I might actually just turn this episode off. That's what I said as soon as I saw it. I said Tholian Web. But, uh, alas, it was not meant to be. Wait, what number one is on the bridge? When the heck did that happen? Singh was just at the con. Now suddenly Una is sitting there. Was she in the bathroom? Off signing another hull piece. What kind of terrible editing is this? And they didn't even bother to give her a line about this very sensitive mission. Oh man, they did you wrong, Una. This writing, brutal. So now Snake Doctor is offering a st strategic operational theory as to how to get out of this snare. Yep, and the crew doesn't find it odd that a counselor seems to know more about the scenario than they do. No one in the writer's room could be bothered to give a doc, give doc a line saying, I've seen this before. We need to do this to escape. Nope, she just looks at the tangled web and instantly is smarter than everyone in the entire crew. That's some counselor. Pike delegates the decision making to Spock, who apparently guesses correctly. Captain Prudence. That was weird, too. It really felt like Spock just picked something randomly. Just come up with a random number. And if that number is correct, we win. Good going, Spock. Oh, look, a ship that is now following the Enterprise. Guess those sensors are down again. Otherwise, this flagship vessel of Starfleet might be able to detect it. 
Snake Doctor and Spock have a private powwow. The only thing worth noting is that Spock doesn't agree with Pike resorting to guesswork when uh, captaining and the Vulcan, and that the Vulcan calls his conversation oh for being nonsensical. He's right on both counts. So if it takes the Enterprise being 100 feet away from a ship before the sensors detect it. Again, we needed some more lines to get this across. Like, you can detect a ship at tens of thousands of miles away. Like, you know. <laughs> uh, it's actually difficult to make something happen in space without telegraphing it to everyone. If you turn on anything in space, you wear a Christmas tree. You light up everybody's sensors everywhere. You can't... It's, it's hard to hide in space without, um, obviously, without a uh, full cloak. Ethan Peck continues to struggle with the condense of the Vulcan language. He needs to learn that vowels are his friends. Instead, he quickly clips his words so much that he is starting to sound like English might not be his first language. No joke. He sounds like my Greek cousin. Nimoy always used to sink into his words. Nimoy always knew that vowels were his friends. An interesting observation. Transporter room. Don't misunderstand. I like the outfit change, but didn't this silly show established that they could beam to their destination and get a change of clothes too. They did. That was something you could do. Finally, number one is right to call a Pike for being fast and loose with his mission. Literally, this should have been happened... <coughs> sorry. Literally, this should have happened a ways back. Sir, can I speak to you in your ready room for a moment? Have her give her opinion much sooner than this. I mean, it's great that she is. She's literally the better captain for this vessel in every way. But this aside comes too late. Yes. Can anyone tell me why these away mission uniforms have lights on their shoulders? Ugh, their rifles, uh, they have rifles for no reason. Sorry. Their rifles have them for a reason. Point them. Not to mention their chins literally block the light when they turn their heads. Intruders aboard the Enterprise. Does anyone seriously think Sing security teams are up for defending the ship? Anyone? Part 2 follows. So Chapel escapes through what might be a Jeffrey's tube, so the ship doesn't so the ship does have them. Remember when Hemmer and Hura didn't know how to escape the cargo bay because one door was blocked? Bad guys get the jump on Pike. Yep, those lights on your shoulders make for amazing targets for bad guys to aim at. Meanwhile, back on the Enterprise, security still hasn't responded to the intruders. Moreover, the bridge isn't remotely secure. Moreover, someone should tell the writers that the turbo lift isn't an elevator granting you access to all decks. It's absolutely asinine that anyone can access the bridge, especially when hostiles have boarded the vessel. I think I remember seeing random security crew on the bridge in the first episode, and that's it. Apparently Singh is inept running this department. Agreed. Writers think Spock is data again, as this insurrection of the bridge plays out. Spock flees the bridge for deck four. He really should be heading to engineering, as it is now the most sensitive air on the ship. I hope this deck four nonsense is so that he can drop off the dead weight of the Doctor Snake, of Doctor Snake at sickbay. Green Orion like dude pats Pike's cheek instead of a ruffling through his rib fest Johnny Bravo hair. If only. Haha, <laughs> his hair does move, doesn't move during the throes of Aloha Alora passion, but it moves here. You just gotta punch him. The moral of the story is that Pike shouldn't should be punched often. Pike and crew a seconds away from being murdered, and he's joking about food. Does anyone think this is a good writing or good captaining or funny? No. Um, it's called Joss Whedon. Uh, <clears throat> you can see the rise of quip-laden dialogue. At uh, you can see it rise um, parallel to the rise in uh, the popularity of Joss Whedon. Um, anything he's ever written is full of taking a, a tense moment and punctuating it with non-funny quips. It's so annoying. Is the Orion Irish? Oh my goodness, are these pirates seriously talking about food right now? This is ridiculous. Oh, so very ridiculous. With all this money, can the show finally hire a decent stunt choreographer? Because this sequence with Nurse Die Hard Chapel was laughable. Bottom shelf stuff here, folks. Ribfest Johnny Prudence Bravo is back. 
at doing what he does best, cooking. Also, a third grader could write a better situation than this. I know. Mm. What is it? Stop interrupting my video. Stop. <laughs> this scene between Pike and the Orion is so cringe-inducing that I kept it playing while I escaped to the bathroom. What a trope. What an absolute unoriginal bottom-of-the-barrel trope. This may be the well... This may well be the worst scene this season. It's tropey as hell. Spock and Snake Doctor in Sick Bay. I actually had to rewind and put subtitles on in order to understand one of Peck's lines. Seriously, why does this actor rush all the time? It's not a race, dude. You don't have the dictation trough to speak this quickly. Neither do I. And yes, there we have it. Jeffrey's tubes. I feel vindicated. Hammer and her apparently are inept for forgetting them. Back when they were stuck in the cargo bay, kudos for Spock agreeing with me that engineering is where he should be going. I'm hoping that Spock is being written with the insight that he knows the Snake Doctor is the bad guy. We shall see. Poor Rebecca Remain. She has to say the terrible lines like, Oh, Chris, oh no, not Alpha Braga 4. This is... Ugh, this was bad. This isn't funny. This isn't clever. This is for 12-year-olds. And you shouldn't write terrible dialogue for 12-year-olds when yours is a 56-year-old franchise. Fire these writers. Writers, writing is where they fail. That's where you trip up the hardest, isn't the writing? Honestly, when it comes, when the rubber hits the road, it's your writing that matters. Okay, and this ain't it, Chief. Man, nothing like clean floors to tell an audience that this alien set is actually just another soundstage. Haven't seen an alien location this uninspired since Obi Wan Kenobi on Disney Plus. Don't know anything about that show. In engineering, honestly, I'm gonna keep subtitles on for put. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to keep subtitles on because of Peck. Oh, Peck, you're in the big leagues now. Get a vocal coach already. Spock sealing the doors to engineering only exposes the ineptitude of the bridge officers not sealing the doors to the bridge in the first place. This crew is so inept, so very inept. And there it is. Snake Doctor is the bad guy. I'm shocked. Shocked, I say. Absolutely. Did not for a second see that coming. How original. I mean it. Wow, speechless. This may be the most original writing I've ever seen in my life. Oh, standing awards, all the awards, so many awards. Writing this original and, un in <laughs> and inspired must be praised and uh, also must be preserved for generations of students yearning to write quality programming such as this. Amazing, so very amazing. Raises for all, especially Alex Kurtzman, my hero. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for this film. Thank you for this, this art. Uh, actually, you were, if you were to be believed and you were speaking the truth, you, uh, you are much more, um, you are much more, much more insightful than I am. I was uh, a little bit more tricked about this than you were. I guess I'm just more trusting. Um, I guess that's why I'm in engineering. Maybe you should be in command. Maybe, Michael, you should be captain of this ship. Apparently, Angel needs a vocal key change in order to hammer home this incredible moment of dramatic television. Speaking of an angel with tremendous vocal resonance, I want to watch Rent again. Not that terrible Chris Columbus movie, but the stage musical. Haven't watched the production in several years. In my head cannon, the Snake Doctor suddenly busts out in, into Today for You, and Spock is wondering why Una doesn't sing as well as Snake Doctor does. If you've seen Rent or know what Rent is, maybe this piece of this comment means something to you. I don't know what Rent is, so thanks anyway. So, why isn't Spock just ordering the computer to lock out the system again? I came for you, Spock. Cough. Hey, it's T'Pring. Holy smokes, did the show get a discount on eyeshadow this week or what? Yeah, T'Pring is laying it on a little thick, if you know what I mean. Oh my, Angel is full on over the top with T'Pring now. Why well, get straight to the point when you can get straight to the crews and tangos, am I right? Sorry, that's a very Toronto-specific joke since this show is filmed here and I'm born and bred there. Side note, crews and tangos is so much fun. I've never been. So, we are close enough to contact the Pring, but two days away from contacting Starfleet. Is this Discovery? Pike is, Pike is Alpha Braga 4-ing, and I hate it so much that I'm not going to bother writing about it. Yeah, I hated, hated everything with that plot. With Pike apparently being so cartoonishly good at tricking pirates that he can just basically inspire an insurrection amongst the crew and then take over operations of their ship. Yeah, I doubt that. Doubt. Doubt on that one. 
Spock gets stunned by a phaser and then immediately is awake again. And no, Trapel doesn't revive him. She magically has a scanner and a pad in her hands, but she doesn't inform us that she uh, revives him. Also, why is Trapel still alive, actually? Exactly. I'm going to guess that the plot will need her for some nonsense reason. Spock says to Trapel, I apologize for advance and any liberties I take. And I obviously see where this garbage is heading. Oy vey, all this budget, and nary a quality writer. So when your bad guy has to point out that this romance is so obviously a ruse, well, what can I what can I say except that it makes for one of the worst, silliest episodes of Star Trek I've ever seen, and I've seen plenty of dumb, also F off music swooping in as if anyone at home wants to see this terrible Spock Chapel love story that the writers are insisting upon. What? What are you suggesting? What are you saying, Kat? What is it? What is it? What? Get going. Get going. Get going now. I can't believe this is the same show that gave us that good first episode. It seems like a masterpiece compared to where we are now. I'm inclined to agree. Backdoor codes? Get out of my chair. This is bad writing. Really, really bad writing. Ortegas asks, What does firing gently even mean? No kidding. Just ask Uhura. For some reason, Chapel and Spock are still alive on the bridge right now. Snake Doctor beams away. Oh God, please don't bring them back. They're coming back. They are not remotely interesting enough to warrant a second appearance. Actor isn't terrible, just not remotely in the same universe in the show is set. And absolutely not remotely interesting enough to bring back. So, don't. Like ever. I was a little bit more positive on it than you were. Uh, <coughs> uh, I thought the villain, Angel, it's not great, but... Honestly, I found it a little bit better than what we've been getting. Like, we've had numerous villains show up in Discovery, and I, I liked Angel more than them. I don't like Leland. I didn't like um, Osira. But this I thought this was a, 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 t- a tiny improvement, at least. You may disagree. But because Pike is the worst captain in all of Starfleet, he can't even alpha, bra- <laughs> he can't even alpha brag a four without screwing it up. Come on. Everybody can alpha brag a four. I can alpha brag a four in my sleep. I can alpha brag a four blindfolded. Are you joking me up right now? One-dimensional pirates can't seem, seems, to retain power and control of the invaluable flagship for no reason whatsoever. Ew, this is the first time the Enterprise CGI looks terrible. I have to assume these visuals were rushed. I hope it was rushed, because it's terrible. Yeah... I'm on record basically saying that the CGI for New Trek is um, not confident in itself. It's um, They hide things with a lot of uh, visual artifacting and a lot of strange lens effects and a lot of dark lighting. Um, and when you see these things lit up properly, you realize that they, they look kind of ugly. And proper pearlescent shades for the Enterprise and Federation ships are so key to the look of these ships, but we can't get them with weak CGI here, okay? We need bright, we need Federation duck egg green, that unique color, and we're just, we're getting splotchy grays, and I'm not, I'm not down with it overall. Um, I sincerely wish number one was the captain of the Enterprise, I had to believe she would have read Snake Doctor's file long enough to notice that the real Dr. Aspen, the one with records and Starfleet, looks nothing like this individual on board the Enterprise, or do the writers not think photos exist anymore? I brought that up in my review. I mentioned, I think I mentioned that, can nobody identify what Dr. Aspen should look like? Was there nobody who had seen Dr. Aspen before? I, I did bring that up at some point, and I, was, I had speculated that it, this was her current visage, as Angel was um, the result of maybe like cosmetic surgery. I don't know, but that's me trying to finish the story for them. To bring in Spock, she says she was in the vicinity. Dude, we know. We literally just saw you in the vicinity. Actually, the Enterprise is currently at warp, so I guess you're along for the ride to wherever this terrible captain is taking the ship next. Speaking of kisses without passion, yikes. Battelle and Pike still have the best smooch in all of New Trek. I can't say I've been keeping track of the smooches, and I don't know what constitutes a good smooch, 
but maybe you do. <laughs> this scene with Chapel and Spock confirms that I despise her character. She's not Nurse Chapel. She is Victim Chapel. Go have a pity party elsewhere, you whiny, needy, uninteresting, unfunny, self-centered person, you. Man, I can't stand her. Lieutenant Dever dodge a bullet. Big time. I'm not sure what that means. Um, and there it is. After four seasons of Michael Burnham and nearly two seasons of this incarnation of Spock, both selectively forgetting his existence, do we finally get our first reference appearance of Cybok? I can only imagine which intern had the distinct honor of watching Old Trek and finally discovering this tidbit. Doubtless, this intern had to inform Lord Kurtzman of Cybok's existence, thus further undermining previous Michael Burnham moments on Discovery. Can you just imagine the look on Alex's face when he suddenly realized there was filmed proof that linked credence to his criticisms from lifelong Star Trek fans of his clueless stewardship, who've hated what he's done to this once-beloved franchise? Yes, Spock did have another sibling. His name was Cybok. And we are adding contrivance upon contrivance by introducing Michael. Turns out Cybok had a secret sister and a secret brother. Who would have known? Not Kurtzman. Conclusion. This is the worst episode of the season. Is it? Uh, I absolutely hated it. If you loved it, that's awesome. Thanks for being... Uh, ha thanks for having the humility to admit that people might like things you don't. Since you're so smart, Michael Strathmore. You're, you seem smarter than I do. Score, 3 out of 10. And there is his ranking rubric, if you're interested. Thank you a lot, Michael Strathmore, for your effort. Uh, Undertaker 45. For Strange New World Season 1, Episode 7. I think you just hit on what's wrong here. Everyone says, can't blame the actors. They just act what they're told to say. Okay, but you just nailed it there. Used to be really good actors who not only understood their craft, but their character. And even when Nimoy and Shatner were running from TOS, they took their role seriously and professionally. Maybe these folks just feel entitled and don't care on any level. Maybe they're just not great trained or generally good actors. I think you nailed it. Um, I do think... On the whole, the caliber of actors we've been getting is markedly lower than what we had, say, by the time DS9 was around. But at the same time, it's not even fair. Like, we hit a, we hit a caliber of actor by the time DS9 came around that is actually it's hard to match today, right? Like... It's like you're comparing, you know, it, you can't you can't compare this to DS9 or TNG, or TOS for that matter, just in terms of acting. This is in, uh, Modern Trek is very much in a mass-produced TV um, network time slot filler caliber of acting, so you have to judge it like that, unfortunately. We're just not in the same tier as we used to be, but thanks you, thank you, um, Undertaker45 for your comments on Season 1, Episode 7. Michael Strathmore again for uh, Strange New World Season 1, Episode 6. I, I must say, to preface this, uh, Pike's performance, Season 1, Episode 6. What? Pike's performance in Season 1, Episode 6. Uh, to me, this is the worst Pike in the season. I was I was very unhappy with Pike this, this episode. And I wonder if what Michael Strathmore says here is going to reflect that. Look, look at the first line. I appreciate that this won't be popular, but I think it's time we talked about Captain Pike. In this episode alone, when she shoots down a vessel, I'm sorry, but that's what happens. Yeah, Uhura commit manslaughter. Yeah, that's right. The spider claims to the contrary. The vessel does not change course and fly into her phaser fire. It just doesn't. Even if it did... It wouldn't change the fact that her is terrible at her job at this moment, but it's Pike that bothers me the most at this moment. He doesn't reprimand her, nor does she reprimand Singh for not taking her station in a real-world situation that could have easily ensured this catastrophe is avoided. Pike doesn't order scans of the vessel to determine if there are any survivors. Pike doesn't order the tractor beam to be engaged, so that he might prevent the craft from hurtling towards the planet. Pike has so little information at this moment, yet fails to do the absolute bare minimum here in order to maintain the order one might expect with the competent commander. So what does he do? He leaves the bridge, without security no less, and heads to the transporter room with his first officer. 
moments following this tragedy. For all you know, it was a hurry just shot down the good guys. And she and the guests now beaming aboard are the actual enemies he needs to worry about. Yeah, for all he knows, there could be hundreds of additional enemy vessels arriving while his bridge remains unattended and damaged vessel continues to plummet to the moon below. Later in this episode, Pike again watches yet another bridge officer basically commit manslaughter, this time with a tractor beam. The officer in question fails to disengage the tractor beam before the ship explodes. Again, Pike fails to reprimand her for being too slow to follow his orders. Pike again fails to scan for any possible life forms that he might still save, and Pike doesn't so much as order an investigation into what just happened, you know, just as to ensure it might not be a problem moving forward. Add to all this the fact that Pike again is portrayed to be prejudiced against another alien culture, and we can only arrive at one conclusion. Pike is terrible at his job, simply terrible. He continues to be depicted as the least deaf captain in all of Starfleet, and certainly nowhere worthy of captaining the flagship of the fleet. I don't care how charming or good-looking he is, he's not a competent captain. It's an absolute shame and a waste of Anson Mount's incredible talents. For me, uh, Pike's worst moment in this episode was at the very end, where um, that girl was explaining to him, trying to, she was trying to justify torturing the first servant to power um, the entire planet. I, don't ask me how that works. But, okay, that's one thing. But then she insinuates that the Federation itself is just as guilty or 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 equally guilty for something else she does not understand. She just, she paints the Federation with the same brush Pike would paint her culture as, right? When she doesn't know anything about the Federation. She doesn't understand the ins and outs of the Federation, and Pike just goes with it. He just goes along with this idea that the Federation is also somehow sacrificing uh, the autonomy of children to achieve some other goal. It's 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 harebrained. I don't understand it. And Pike has nothing to say about it. Pike has no retort. Pike is not like well, I see it this way. He does. He has nothing to offer. I mean, you don't get to be captain of the Federation flagship without also being up on your diplomacy skills, you know, to explain, you know, setting the record straight for people. That was, that was this, this is Pike's worst episode, in my opinion. Um, number one, uh, episode six was bad for him. Serene Squall number two, because in Serene Squall he lost control of the Enterprise to ill-equipped and stupid pirates. It was just a disaster. Power Cage for Season 1, Episode 6. Uh, the most expensive looking deodorant ad in the world. That's, uh... That's, uh, Captain Pike for you. Uh, I am not a nugget, Blackheart, for Season 1, Episode 6. Your intro gave me a good laugh, like a Pinto, but worse. Just something flying by makes it blow up. Hey, the Dingwall's a good ship. Thanks, Power Cage. This is a good ship. Just because we blow up by being in the vicinity of a, tor a torpedo doesn't mean we're a bad ship. It, uh, we're, uh, we're lived in. We're cultured. We're rustic. You know, we're a classic. There's nothing wrong with that. Thanks, Power Cage, and thank uh, thank you, I Am Not a Nugget Blackheart. 